tonight I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, a subject that, as a rule, I, I avoid talking about uh, when I work with students. I figure, you know, my job is to sort of, at least at KU, is to teach uh, sort of subject matter in design management strategy and also interaction and UX design. Uh, and as a rule, I just don't talk about sort of meta subjects like career, uh, you know, management, planning, and all that kind of stuff. Um, just because my career is kind of weird, and I, I don't hold myself up as a great example of, uh, you know, like the consummate uh, design, uh, you know, or as, let's say, a, a conventional kind of designer. So, uh, but I can teach stuff and that's kind of what I do. And, but today I wanted to take the opportunity to do this, um, given this sort of circumstances in which we find ourselves here in the middle of a uh, economic uh, sort of collapse as well as some of the other anxieties that we're facing. And I, um, I have lived through and sort of tried to make a career through uh, now three different uh, economic recessions. And in each case, I've always been impacted just like so many millions of others, uh, career-wise. Uh, and uh, I think in uh, 1991, 92, uh, I was working at, in Washington, DC, as teaching at the University of Maryland and also consulting with the Smithsonian Museums. And, uh, and suddenly uh, Maryland closed about six or seven departments and, uh, and it didn't look good there. So I took a job at Minnesota, which I only stayed at for a little while, but I, I wanted to get out of teaching anyway. So it wasn't always a bad thing, but it did force me to leave a job. And then in uh, 2000, to 2001 or so, uh, with that recession, uh, my company, uh, the company I was working for, uh, Sybase, which is now SAP, uh, laid off, uh, well, uh, they closed uh, the office I was in, and uh, I did not want to move to Toronto. So uh, th three others uh, that I work with, we basically peeled off and started a a consulting firm, and that's kind of the firm that I still operate today as human center. Uh, and then the very last, uh, the very last uh, sort of uh, recession hit around 2008 or so when we were just launching the uh, graduate design program at the University of Kansas, and uh, uh, we launched it in the middle of that recession and uh, fairly quickly, we got uh, quite a few folks in the program. We thought we were just like really savvy uh, to, to, to sort of get all these new students, but it was really just because students were, or people were trying to assess their careers and going back to school and get a master's. So, so these recessions uh, tend to define us and uh, and I thought it would be appropriate a little bit to talk about career since I've been impacted in my career by economic recession and these challenges. So it's not as if I've been immune to it at all. So uh, tonight I wanted to talk uh, kind of, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna have a little introduction for probably about uh, 15 minutes or so uh, and I'm using sort of the metaphor of, uh, of uh, sort of uh, dramatic uh, theater and so forth in talking about a career as sort of a story or a narrative with a narrative structure in three acts. And so we're going to kind of borrow that uh, little, uh, you know, metaphor uh, and talk about uh, acts and scenes and so forth in a career. So first a little introduction, and I'll go through about oh, five or six different little chunks of information. You're welcome to comment or ask questions or put them in, this, in the uh, chat window. Uh, and uh, 
I or uh, Hannah will uh, sort of uh, try to voice them in case you don't want to voice them yourselves. But, uh, but uh, in any case, uh, so we'll have a little introduction set, uh, sort of portion. Then we'll, I'll kind of open it up to just general questions and comments that you guys might have. Uh, I think your input, your perspective is as, as valid as anything I might happen to say. And so I'm open to whatever you have to say. My, my take on things is a little bit odd or different probably, but maybe there's some common uh, sort of sharing of the minds here. And then after that section, we'll have what I call uh, scenes one through five of this uh, first, uh, first act of uh, this uh, sustaining a design career. And we'll talk about uh, building your core value stock uh, understanding business and industry, designing in teams, and integration, and so forth, and we'll go down that. So um, that's kind of my plan for tonight. Do you guys have any questions or comments at all? Okay, cool. All right. Well, uh, just to kick off, uh, <clears throat> so you know, I think I sort of covered this a little bit, but uh, essentially I, uh, you know, the whole idea of storytelling is uh, traces back to Aristotle and, and into his uh, poetics and, uh, and the idea of how, uh, how stories are sort of a chain of cause and effect actions that inspire subsequent actions and until a, a, a conclusion is reached. And you can go back and in all kinds of different ways, three act or five act structure is sort of laid out in uh, certain patterns that are pretty familiar across uh, theater, um, uh, uh, let's say novels, fiction, as well as you know films and so forth. And um, so, you know, my take here is that I, I really consider a life and a career as uh, a series of acts moving across three or more phases. And I happen to be living and sort of practicing design, uh, believe it or not, after already a 40 year career of practice. And it's been a, a bit of a uh, cavalcade of excitement and weirdness uh, all along. but. I think some of you, I think this first, uh, this first uh, workshop is really targeted at the first act. And, and that's why I talked about, uh, sort of broke it out in that way. Uh, I guess in subsequent sessions will have uh, sort of conversations around the second act of a professional design career, how that is similar, but also quite different. And then the third act of a, of a design career. So, I think it's I think it's a it's common to experience a professional life as sort of like one one job or one gig after another, uh, lots of you know some successes, some failures, and some surprises along the way, and uh, some of it may seem random or unpredictable, but in some regards, it can be quite predictable, and sometimes that's the worst part when it gets too predictable. So. Uh, I guess the question is based on the career phase uh, phase that you're in and the context that per, that's being presented right now, how do we best pursue the course ahead? That's really the big challenge and the big question that you guys, that we all have to answer individually. And unfortunately, just because you, you may have strike it rich and have success early on, there's absolutely no uh, uh, promise that, you're, that that success will continue. And so uh, prediction is tricky. And, uh, and I think especially at times like this, we have these kind of sometimes lonely soul searching uh, sessions when we're trying to figure out what in the hell am I going to do next? And uh, it's not always evident or obvious, but you kind of have to keep plugging along. I don't know if this is self-evident to you guys or uh, not all that uh, relevant, but feel free to, 
commenter. I, I can't see the chat uh, window for some reason. So uh, maybe uh, Hannah could voice anything or uh, some of the questions. Sure. So, um, yes, please. Sorry, Michael, would you like me to read off the questions now or should we save it later for the question and answer session? Yeah. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, I'll, I'll <laughs> kind of leave that up to you. I'm, I'm willing to respond to things as we go along. I don't want to just plow ahead uh, incessantly, but we will have uh, a, se a section for Q&A, certainly. So. Yeah, I think it can be great to save it until the Q&A that we can. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, so these are the, the, different, the different acts that I'm sort of breaking this workshop out in uh, over three different sessions. Um, I think the next one will probably happen possibly in September and then the third in November. And these are the titles. Uh, so I call this building your core design value stock. And I know that that's a weird phrase and we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more shortly and why I use that nomenclature. And then the second is expanding your scope of design knowledge and influence where you can sort of really sort of stretch yourself building on the foundation that you've established in your first act. And then the third act is how do you vest your reach and power across disciplines and industry? In other words, this becomes something uh, uh, sort of extra in a sense. It's sort of design in a not a typical formulaic way. It's more about influence and shaping decisions and so forth. And uh, so this is sort of uh, how it's broken out uh, so far. So, and I welcome any input that you guys may have. So what I've done here is, uh, you know, as some of you may have actually been involved in some of this stuff over the years, but periodically we've done sort of research on graduate design students uh, or prospective graduate design students. And we've done user research. We've done, you know, user uh, personas, archetypes based on these. We actually have a, a fairly decent um, take on kind of the different sorts of people who might consider graduate design work. And, uh, and the way we approach it is we're looking, uh, as a rule, we're looking at early to mid-career professionals, okay? These are people who, for whom there's some separation usually between college and, and career, uh, or maybe mid-career. We've had people at all different uh, life phases here. And we've sort of like done some of this, and you could kind of call these the characters in this in this uh, play, if you will. And uh, in Act One, uh, you know, you have people who are maybe s just out of college or design school, but you also may have people who are turning to design from engineering or from from business or other fields. So they're kind of new but they're coming to it a little bit later in life. This is pretty common in most design schools today. So, and so we've done some of these, some of this analysis, there's nothing super special about it, but, and, uh, but it's been useful for us to just kind of get a, a sense of what are the key uh, sort of uh, patterns that, that these people are expressing in, in what they bring to the table. And then uh, we also talk about, I think it's opportune now to, to broach this conversation because times like this are really helpful opportunities to get clear on exactly what are our options and what are the, the constraints upon us and what are the possibilities. And it also forces us to look at the big picture and not just keep your head down doing your day-to-day -day job or something, but to try to shape the direction of your career and not simply take whatever happens to be coming, you know, on the job boards or, or what a, a headhunter brings to you, that kind of thing. So I think our challenge here, which, you know, it's good to be reminded of is to really maximize your career prospects and to really 
try to be ambitious and try to do some things that stretch yourself and make you feel very uncomfortable because that's usually an indicator that you're doing something worthwhile because it's easy to make dumb mistakes and make bad choices. And we've all made them, um, but it's useful to sort of like really be uh, cognizant of this whole picture and, uh, you know, plot it out, uh, do some mapping of this whole uh, enterprise because you can look at this career as this career planning as a, de a a complex design problem and you can break it down and make sense of it. So, and uh, also this is another thing that I find makes, is, is problematic for a lot of people because you get familiar doing certain things and you're good at them and you get good feedback. It's really, really smart to push yourself to do things that are, uh, uh, not easy or unfamiliar to you and to build some of the some more diversity in the kinds of uh, the kinds of things that you want to do that you have not done well or at all in the past and uh, and that complementary value uh, can sort of make you a, a much more valuable asset or valuable property if you will from a, a design standpoint. Uh, and this kind of, I know that people have asked about this weird graphic on the title slide of this deck. And I think I shared with Lars the a URL to a, toward a PDF of this deck here. Maybe Lars could share that on the, on the, uh, the chat board if he'd like. Uh, but this graphic that. is weird, uh, and I, I, I really am leery to tell you where it came from because it is so fucking weird. But um, I just love it, and I've loved it for a long time, and I've messed with it over the years. But to begin with, I just wanted to say that uh, I've used this sort of two-by-two two matrix, pretty common, the idea of looking at the kind of work that we take on and that we seek and take on uh, on a continuum between uh, high or low value or impact. In other words, some projects you happen to get maybe from your employer or a client, you have the opportunity to really to make an impact or to do something highly valuable for a change. And so, some projects can be plotted on that horizontal sort of uh, dimension. But then on the vertical dimension, you can look at the work you do in a continuum of relevance or satisfaction. Is it something that you really like to do or that you're challenged by and it's interesting? Uh, or is it not super relevant either to you maybe or, or whatever? And so I think we're always trying to trying to find work and to try to create work entrepreneurially, not just wait for it to show up, but to actually be entrepreneurial and uh, business-minded, find partners, start up enterprises, and, and uh, you know those kinds of things. There's all kinds of weird models out there to adopt, but to try to find ultimately work that's both desirable and highly valuable, that's what we're shooting for. And so <laughs> to explain that weird graphic on the title slide, it's, uh, that is trying to represent the three stages of a design career. Um, but I'm using an actual uh, modified graphic from how back in the 1950s or 40s, um, this, is, this was actually representing uh, the uh, success and, and uh, size of the market for manufactured refrigerators in the United States for a particular brand. I can't remember which brand it was, but it was sort of like, you know, Westinghouse or some, one of those brands. And they were charting over a period of, let's say, three or four decades the, the relative success of their different product lines, you know. Uh, high-end refrigerators, low-end refrigerators, maybe even stoves and ovens and all that kind of stuff. 
and it was just showing how some models kind of launched and then petered out and others continued for 20 or 30 years. And I kind of see a design career as similar in a weird way because over a period of four years, you get many, many different projects and, and clients and maybe employers that you stay with or stay with you. And, uh, and some of them you keep for decades. I have clients that I've worked with for 20 years now and they keep coming back for some strange reason. And it's great because you, you gain a lot of domain expertise, and industry expertise. And so I see as these clients, the ones that, that keep coming back and I get like big projects, big work, uh, you know, assignments as the big uh, sort of like uh, little tubes that go between, you know, over a period of time. Some are big, some are small, some are interesting, some are not so interesting. Some are like highly valuable and others not so much. And it's just a way to sort of track the continuum of work that, that I happen to have gotten. And the, the key thing that's easily missed is that upper right quadrant of that matrix, the, the high value, high impact, uh, highly satisfying work. You'll notice that maybe starting out, your work tends to be on the bottom side of that quadrant or of that two by two matrix. And if you're maybe doing a few things right, maybe the work sort of gravitates into that top right um, quadrant where the work actually generates much more value for the client and also is way more satisfying, you know, that kind of thing. So that's, I just had, I felt I kind of had to explain that strange graphic that I weirdly love. So, okay. Uh, and then uh, why me and not somebody else? <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I, a few years ago, I was invited back to speak at my, uh, the college that I graduated from. <clears throat> I was a art student studying painting and drawing and printmaking and some graphic design. And, uh, and I also was like really benefited from the honors program there. But I, I found that art training or sort of creative training was really, really helpful to me in business because I got really good at discerning and integrating things, seeing things clearly and integrating conceptual, intellectual, visual things that frankly, a lot of my peers and other majors and so forth, just were, they kind of sucked at, but we were sort of trained to be good at making those distinctions. And I think you have to go value that. And so I don't, I don't regret, even though, this field that I perform in, it's nothing like anything that existed back then. We could never have predicted how the, this uh, sort of these disciplines that we're practicing, how they ever came to be. Um, but they, they helped, I think uh, that training sort of helped me and possibly you guys as well to be able to sort of see things for what they are and take advantage of opportunities. So it also caused me to be like, just kind of weirdly fearless in doing new things when things are so uncertain. And to basically talk, talk truth to clients and tell them like in really blunt language sometimes if something's fucked up or not, or if something's working. And because I know I'm gonna get fired anyway at at the end of the assignment probably. <laughs> so I don't really have to like uh, sort of pretend that I'm you know, on my best behavior. I just wanna be honest. And frankly, I have found over and over that that's what people want in a good consultant is that, clear, that uh, sort of candor and honesty and expert judgment. So, so uh, and I just, I wanted to put these little quotes up here. I th they're kind of similar. And I think Steve Jobs probably ripped off Kierkegaard when he, he was giving a talk at Stanford University years ago. And uh, he was saying that you cannot connect the dots forward 
career-wise, you can only connect them looking backward. And you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, karma, whatever. This approach has never let me down, he said. It's always made the difference in his life. And so this whole notion that life can only be understood backwards, not forwards, I have some problems with. Because I think as designers, it's kind of our job to anticipate what could be and not simply settle for uh, what, what currently is and familiar patterns. And we have to get really a lot better at connecting dots forward. And uh, because I don't think it's hopeless to do that. Uh, so that's my take. We're getting toward the end of this, trust me. The other thing, why am I pushing this? Um, and why is this thing free? Um, UXPA says that they don't do many free kind of sessions. And maybe that's why we have so many participants. But um, well, uh, as you know, universities are always, uh, or at least this time of year, are always looking for students. And so uh, I just wanted to sort of pitch the fact that we are taking applications for uh, uh, formal applications or sort of like uh, non-degree seeking applications for uh, fall courses and, and the program itself. So for instance, uh, you know, we have, you know, four instructors here. Hannah, who's on this call, she's one of our uh, instructors. She teaches uh, interaction. She teaches uh, uh, sort of design methods and, 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 uh, and so forth. We also have uh, human factors courses that are taught. Uh, I teach the interaction design management and strategy courses. And then Brooke Graham, she teaches the interaction design, uh, or she teaches uh, uh, scenarios and simulations course and such. So, so we, these courses are offered both to Kansas City and Lawrence students, and our courses are connected via a video conference, but we also do meet. Um, on alternating weeks. Um, and then some of the, for those of you who are from the program, this is all familiar, but these are the, the seven basic sort of main courses that we offer spring and fall. And uh, people can join as non-degree seeking students just for a course or two, or they can formally apply to the program. And applications are due next week. So we welcome applications. That's my pitch. I'm, I'll shut up now about that, okay? And I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Finally, on this little intro, sorry, it's going a while. Uh, have you ever heard this, this notion of T-shaped people? I know Richard Branham, who used to teach here at KU, he used to go on and on about it. But it actually has fairly long history. Uh, and you know the idea that T-shaped people are supposed to be well-rounded personalities, highly sought after, and uh, they're a variation on the Renaissance man. So that's a red flag right there. It's a person in that who is T-shaped is equally comfortable with information systems, mon modern management techniques, and various other kinds of things. So this is from a, a article from many years back. But the idea here is that the T-shaped person has both a deep functional discipline or specialty, and from there he or she can branch out or broaden, you know, across multiple different things. And that's cool, but it always struck me as kind of an odd metaphor. I don't know if it's just me, but I kind of, you know, consider over a T-shaped uh, career over for 40 years, frankly, I don't see why you can't have more than one vertical, you know, uh, you know, penetrations into the ground or whatever, why you can't have, you know, multiple different uh, uh, deep competencies and branching across over those. And I'm going to take this weird metaphor even farther and compare it to something that it's actually kind of living in my neck of the woods. I'm from Northern Utah, but there is in South Central Utah, the world's largest single living organism covering 106 acres 
and 47,000 genetically identical quaking aspen trees that all originally originated from a single parent clone. They all share this exact same DNA and they're all connected through an underground root system. So my, my criticism of that whole T-shaped trope is that we really should not be focused on, focusing on the individual T-shaped person, but frankly, we should be focusing on the community or the organization of sort of quote unquote T-shaped people and uh, encourage, educate, and develop teams, entire organizations populated by these types of uh, uh, T-shaped people uh, that work in close collaboration and shape the future of things. So, um, and then, you know, here's just sort of a visualization of how that weird um, uh, quake and aspen tree grove kind of works. And I kind of see it as a bunch of roots that all sort of like connect and have vertical, you know, uh, trunks and so forth, and then a canopy above. And that that uh, is a sort of a, a more powerful metaphor than that, that, that strange one of T-shaped people. I don't know if anybody, if I'm offending anybody with that, but uh, I just thought it was so lame and I just had a hard time like taking it. So, so that's, that's uh, sort of the uh, intro. I'm open to any questions or comments that you guys have. Feel free to unmute yourself and talk directly or Hannah can also uh, sort of field some questions from the board. Sure, thank you so much, Michael. That was awesome. Um, I think what well, we, we have a few questions uh, from the very beginning of this little workshop. Um, I think the first question is pretty much self-answered. So being a design, uh, Doug asked, so being a designer is like a, being an actor? Mm -hmm. I'll say your answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Well, I, th I think we're definitely characters. I'm not sure that we're, well, to some extent we do have to act. We, we play a role. We play different roles over different aspects of our lives, I suspect. And, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, I was thinking more of, of designers as, as our, let's see, some of the user research that we've done is more about people who uh, might be good prospects or promising leads for graduate students, people to do advanced design study that goes beyond whatever maybe had come out of undergraduate school. So, right. yeah, so I think you know, I think of them as characters, but, but even to some extent we are actors in a way, you know, we have mm -hmm. to perform, especially when we're, you know, having to give a talk in front of a client or something, you have to like, you know, really be articulate and prepared. I mean, I remember I was listening this, um, podcast and then they talk about empathy and the mm -hmm. guest was talking about well we are not really um, like if he was basically saying that he would be 100 percent satisfied satisfied if his designer is pretending to be empathy empathetic to his client because he can never be <laughs> yeah. actually i mean if you look at the sports team and you know athletes like soccer players they they said they would do everything for their sports team but then like next year they're going to go to another team right and they have the <laughs> same thing so i guess that can be like acting yeah. i guess <laughs> yeah um, that, yeah yeah there may not be a great deal of loyalty to any particular <laughs> team or or company or something i don't know i i uh, i learned how to do sort of ethnographic user research long after I graduated with a PhD in psychology. Because um, in psychology, I was doing sort of research psychology. We weren't actually, you know, doing user research. But my partner uh, at the time uh, was a, he was a, a, a sort of a medical psychologist, a clinical psychologist. And, and I shadowed him for a while, and I learned how to do really good user research and to really, to really uh, 
collect and harvest insights and you know work to develop them into ideas and i think the more you care about people the more that you're open to their ins their inputs it can be like hugely inspiring to a designer because you don't have to manufacture a lot of those a lot of those insights they come to you it's your job to unpack them and make sense of them so yeah and i i um i also see Nar lars was commenting at the time that he could see the designer as both a playwright actor and set designer <laughs> yeah maybe so uh, uh i don't know i uh my first design job was designing department stores of all things big box fashion sort of retail stores and we had a lot of creative control mm -hmm. and I found it to be really interesting because I learned how to build almost anything you know and I had a lot of uh, and I worked with some really talented people and this was mostly in the Seattle area mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know I found it to be like wildly inspiring to uh, to actually create sets, you know, and to create presentations and to attract people, to get them to touch merchandise and buy things, you know, I thought that was great. And you, the thing that was weirdly fascinating is you could actually measure your success. You could calculate sales per square foot in a big department store. You remember those? <laughs> and if something that you were doing facilitated purchasing and so forth and that was a success i thought that was fascinating you know it wasn't just subjective it was quantitative and quantifiable so well then else? i have a follow-up question um mm -hmm. how how would you measure how should we measure our succeed as a designer or our work then do we have any should, new dimensions yeah. of measurement Measure, how do we measure what again? Our success, success. Oh, okay. As a That's designer, a um, yeah. Like, as a like, how do we measure the the successfulness of our career as a designer, as well mm -hmm. as how do we measure the successfulness of the product that we have designed? Um, yeah. Is there any like is there any new dimension that wasn't really existing the back then, but now it is existed in the in terms of UI UX or product design field? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I think my primary clients uh, with human centered tend to be um, organizations and uh, our job is to help them to develop new products and services that attract uh, uh, businesses. And, you know, this is from financial services to, to other uh, industries like healthcare and consumer products, but I think we're we're tracking aggregate success of new products and services to the degree to which they are taken up, and they are building uh, sort of quantif or you know the metrics are uh, let's say size of market of uh, revenue is another metric that you can track um uh sustaining customers or clients in other words retaining uh customers and not having a lot of uh, drop off and so forth so uh generally i can i tend to look at things in aggregate you know sort of numbers and such at least in the work i do but ultimately i mean frankly if you're doing good user research collecting good insights, turning them into ideas and product or service concepts, there is there's certainly a way to test how valid they are. And that is to basically put them in front of people, do some market testing and focus groups and other things and you know assess whether or not what you're developing is is actually working for people or not, you know. And uh, uh, but you know, it's I, there's certain you can find all kinds of different ways to you know measuring stuff is 
there's all kinds of ways to measure stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I think we just have to be much more, do much more sort of like exploration of what are the best ways to measure and the best things to measure. So I hope I kind of answered your question, but I do like to get those metrics because, you know, the old saying is, is that if you don't measure something, uh, it's not going to change. That the measurement is a way right. that you can can track your success and demonstrate your value. So I, I don't shy away from that at all. I think that's an excellent point because I mean, uh, uh, traditionally, like measuring or validating is or assessing is what design has been very lacking traditionally. Mm -hmm. So having that measurement or validation or standard can be really helpful for us to advocate the value of design to non-designers who may not realize, mm -hmm. recognize the value of design yet. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Greg also, Greg Campbell also just commented that metrics of monies are of course fascinating as, the, as is the good your work achieves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, do, I don't know if I could jump into this, but please. I've worked yeah. as a senior designer, a senior architect, and my um, last position was actually as the head of UX. And so I've been able to work my way up the chain. But I have yet at a company, and I acknowledge that I work um, primarily with um, companies that are in and organizations that are in the center of America, not on the coast. And I'm definitely learning that that's a different experience. Um, but when you're trying to define the ROI and develop those measurements and actually help paint the story behind how to do those evaluations and measurements, um, I often can't get the board, I often can't get the product people on board with doing my kind of measurements versus theirs because mm -hmm. they don't want to proverbially waste the money on UX measurements. Any measurement is the same, can be used for UX. Even when I found myself at companies, um, like for example, the absolute most extreme was at a company that had nearly 100 products. I think it was 96 products. And only three of them made them any actual money. So <laughs> even just using that as a point of, you do realize that if, you, if we were measuring against what problems we were solving, what value we were, bring, we were bringing, the whole, the, the mini scape of usability, is it actually useful? Is it used by anybody? And mm -hmm. Is it overall usable? If we were measuring just against those three, forget the whole story arc, but just against those three, then we would mm -hmm. already know what products were hitting for whom. But what we're measuring mm -hmm. is how they navigate the page. Did they land on the page? We're not measuring anything as to why they got there. It didn't matter <laughs> how I pitched it, anything like that. Um, no, I couldn't get anybody on board with measuring that way, measuring for experiences as a full follow through, as a fuller intent versus just an afterthought, afterthought to deliver after the fact. Yeah. Uh, and who is this speaking again? I'm sorry. Uh, Lindsay McNeil. Hi, sorry, Lindsay. I was a late addition. <laughs> no problem, no problem. That's a really good point. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not sure I can give you any sort of secret solution to the, you know, like some hidden uh, uh, sort of uh, key to unlock that door. I think to some extent you're dealing with like there are just a lot of companies that are kind of fucked up. No, you know, uh, please apologize. I apologize for my language, but no, nope, that's some... basically what Stephen Gates <laughs> told me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the best and, adjective uh, for it. There you go. So uh, and also, you know, there is something in some ways kind of seriously pathological about some companies or moderately so. And I think that there are, in other words, if they don't quote unquote, listen to reason, you can try to do it in multiple different types of ways, but ultimately you can't really control what they're going to accept or, or pay attention to. Um, but um, I think you can make a really compelling set of arguments for the, the things that you're proposing to do in really hard business terms, or really like clear business terms. Businesses should not be threatening to you. Business is relatively easy compared to doing advanced design as far as I can tell. I mean, really, uh, there's a lot to learn, but 
we have, uh, I think you just have to make a hell of a business case for what you're proposing to do and price it right. And, uh, you know, try to show them the value and demonstrate the value that can return. And if they're just blind to the argument, there's just not a heck of a lot you can do um, other than, you know, cultivate clients uh, or other, you know, in other divisions or other companies or whatever. But, uh, but it can be super frustrating, even when you're bending over backwards to make a strong business case for, for doing certain kinds of, uh, let's say, uh, design sort of uh, related research. And because frankly, if a company, just because it's not familiar to them, some of the design stuff that you're proposing is simply, they didn't get it in school, so they don't pay attention, they don't value it. So, but if, but it's, it's entirely doable to make a strong business case for it and uh, that would more, more than pay for itself, you know. Uh, but, you know, say la vie, I guess. Thank you for your question or comment. This is a, a great conversation we're having, but I think we should maybe continue the presentation if that's all right with you, Michael. Okay, that's great. Just to be cognizant of time. Absolutely. Let's, let's get going. Thank you, guys. And uh, I'll have some more questions here shortly. Um, let me, uh, here we are. This is, this is just actually is not like super, super long. So, um, but um, I kind of break this down. I, I like five scenes, <laughs> five scenes in an act. Okay. And the, this, this whole workshop is sort of act one. And this is scene one where Gia may be one of our sort of persona type characters uh, goes about building a deep discipline. Uh, or about deep discipline mastery. And once again, she's in the first sort of phase or first act of her design career, and therefore she has a lot to learn. And so, um, so I, I've adopted this, I don't know, I, there's a guy I really kind of hate to like, and that is Scott Adams. I don't know if you know who he is. He's the, the, the uh, artist behind du uh, Dilbert. And, uh, but he, he uses this term of the talent stack. He says one of the most important powerful, powerful systems he's used to seen involves layering one modest skill on top of another until the effect is something special. And when you learn to see the world in terms of systems, not goals, everything comes into focus. And I, I agree with that, but um, he kind of takes it in some weird ways, but he admires the talent stack of Donald J. Trump, I think, so for what it's worth. But the way I want to interpret that is I want to call it not a talent stack, because frankly, talent is a weird term. Talent is something that's sort of innate to an individual, but I want to talk more about knowledge, skills, and abilities that are acquirable, right? They weren't just given to you at birth. That by expanding your stock or your portfolio of design competencies increases your versatility and you add demonstrable value to those who employ your services as a designer. They make you valuable and they extend your career viability over time. So that's why I use that, that term, building your core value stock. It's like you're building a stock of, um, of uh, valuable competencies, skills, abilities, understandings that make you far more than just a quote unquote run of the mill designer, but you're actually showing, you know, tremendous versatility that isn't, that's kind of in some ways unique to yourself, you know, and I think that really developing yourself, especially in the first phase of your career, is acquiring some of that knowledge, the, the explicit knowledge that you can get in workshops and various kinds of, you know, uh, educational programs or training sessions, but also tacit knowledge, just understandings of people and then learning those skills and ability. This is really like a, a building process. Then scene two is where Brian, one of our sort of, uh, uh, let's say, advanced study type 
uh, prospects is he's working in in act one of his career to develop deep understanding of business and the industry in which he works. Now, this doesn't seem too sexy probably to you, but I found I was, I was uh, hired and worked for three or four years in a company called Sybase, which was the fifth largest software company in the world at one time, and now is like part of SAP. And I was, I had run my own firm for like seven years and I just got sort of like tantalized by the kind of work that, you know, was being done back around the turn of the century. And so I took a job with Sybase and they essentially made me a design strategy director. And it was a big job. We had like 25 on our staff and it was a great opportunity and I was doing uh, enterprise banking software, kind of the second generation of that type of software. That, uh, and so we did a lot of work with major companies, Fortune 100 companies, you know, financial institutions, and I still do that today. Um, but uh, what I found working with Sybase, I was just shocked at how lazy the design staff was and how like isolating they were, self-isolating. They wouldn't, they, they did not understand, and they were supposedly developing or designing software, uh, but they, they didn't use the software that they designed. They had no idea, frankly, you know, what the competitors were doing. They had no understanding of the industry. <laughs> They were just so fucking lazy. They were just entertaining themselves. And I was shocked and probably kind of, you know, this, I was this older guy, so I'm sure I wasn't the most popular guy, but I was just shocked at how incurious they were about the, the company that they worked in and the industry that was supposedly feeding them. So, so this is, these are some of the components of learning business and, uh, and, uh, learning about the industry in which you're working, competitor analysis, industry analysis, business strategies, business model. This is all out there. It's absolutely available. You don't have to go to school to do this stuff. You can find a lot of this stuff on your own. But I just found it, I found business to be fascinating because I saw it as a weird, perverse form of conceptual art. And as an artist, that's how I got into it. I thought as a kind of a game to play to get people to buy into a concept. And I found it just kind of endlessly fascinating. I was not shocked or appalled by, I know business can be creepy, but I found it to be a fun game and I could be pretty good at it if I put my mind to it. So scene three, we're already halfway through. It says, Ian, uh, is a uh, design leader who has in, who integrates with other business units to create new value. A lot of this stuff comes right out of uh, DMI's uh, uh, sort of uh, DMI toolkit, uh, and uh, it's a fascinating set of resources that are out there. I've taught workshops for Design Management Institute around the world, and. I tell you, there's some genuine value in, they figured out how design creates, uh, you know, revenue, market share growth and everything. And uh, I encourage you guys to, to check it out. It's maybe a few years dated, but they're doing some tremendous work. And, uh, and some of these tools and methodologies are just super powerful and it can kind of set your clients off. I mean, they, once they get a sense of what you're trying to do here using this set of systems and so forth, it's, they're absolute idiots for not taking it seriously. So uh, there's a lot to do and it, I found it to be just fun to, to get into. Um, so, and then scene four in this act is uh, Gia, she learns the practice of systematic new value creation. And uh, this goes back to, for, for some of those KU alums who are sitting in on this call, probably most of you are interaction UX type students. 
but for the design management students, I kind of like, you know, like force fed this shit to you guys over, you know, over in some of my courses. But I tell you, it's so fascinating to, to learn some of the secrets and the skills of not just being creative or clever or anything or doing, you know, fun new innovations, but like doing serious systematic innovation is fascinating. And it, a lot of it comes out of uh, the Institute of Design, Doblin, and those type, that type of institution, which was very influential on the graduate program at KU. And, uh, and so uh, this is just 13 different uh, works or uh, seminars by Larry Keeley. And if you can put up with listening to Larry Keeley for very long, I commend you. He's like really grating, but he is brilliant. And I followed him for like probably 25 years. And, uh, and uh, so I, I encourage you to, to figure out, you know, to sort of get in, under the hood and find out how the best innovation is, is actually done. It's a true practice. It's not some random sort of brainstorming exercise and stuff. Lastly, we got scene five, and this is where Nikki, our character, gets skillful at business contextual research as well as human research. And this, once again, is right out of Kumar from the Institute of Design and, you know, chapters two and three from, uh, there's a lot more to doing uh, contextual research, business sort of, you know, uh, contextual research, background research on business and so forth. But Kumar breaks it down pretty well. You can, it's a good, good first read in sort of, getting deeply familiar with doing really good business analysis and, and study. And then mode three is just knowing people, just doing really good user research and not relying on, let's say, a, a design research specialist to do it for you and just to explain to you what he or she learned, but to get out there, get out of the office and do it yourself. It's much faster, much easier than you think probably. Um, but it does take a commitment. But you put together really good contextual research with uh, ethnographic user research, insights gathering, and so forth, and it is powerful. It just really is. And, uh, and I do it to this day, and I love to do it. At first, I found it uncomfortable, but after a while, we just fall in love with these people. And I never forget these people that we spend time with. It's very intense. And uh, it's just, I think it's tremendously uh, inspiring. So, uh, you know, I hope that big lead up wasn't like a disappointment <laughs> with the sort of the guts of the, uh, of the, uh, of the session today, but Essentially, um, you know, I think the first phase, the first act of a design career is really building up these, uh, these knowledge, skills, and abilities. And they are entirely acquirable. You can do them. You don't have to be born with them as talents. You can get really savvy at them and such. So... Uh, so I'm interested um, in your uh, in your comments or questions uh, if you have any more. Thank you, Michael. Um, I, think I heard highly agree with what you mentioned. Well, I mean, design itself has is very selfless exercise, right? Because we're not designing mm -hmm. for us; we're always designing for user human. So mm -hmm. when I teach a lot of like um, portfolio or senior senior classes where students need to, you know, really seeking for their first job after graduate, they often kind of freaked out because like they've been, they're very familiar with doing something for others, but mm -hmm. not for themselves. And I always mm -hmm. advise them that like, you know, building your career is like you're designing your career, thinking it as your own design project. But then at this time, user or the client is you, right? 
And then that's the moment that they're like, oh my God, I never had to design something for myself. Like, what do I do, right? So that's, I think what you mentioned here during your presentation, including all the, the validation or measurement or research or the books can be really helpful for them to shape their design project if the project itself is building their career. Yeah, very good. Very good. Uh, I have a question from Lars, actually. Mm -hmm stating um for those who are looking to invest in knowledge and skills how do we determine what areas are worthwhile to focus on how do we avoid learning trends but rather learn long-lasting principles uh that's a good question <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know having you know being old i guess is in some ways uh if something doesn't stay around very long, it's generally sort of trendy. And I, I tend to, I remember giving a talk at one point, uh, I think uh, for DMI in Barcelona, and I was, the conference had to do with uh, trends, design trends for the year that it happened to be. And it was like probably 2005 or a long time ago. And, uh, and I, so I was invited to speak, but I said, this topic of this, of this conference is just really boring to me. I'm absolutely uninterested in trends. <laughs> I'm interested in things that last, that persist. And if things hang around for a while, you know, as a rule, that they are uh, meaningful to people and that uh, different people have different points of view on them and so forth. And there's more writing on them. There's maybe some really, some good, good reading to be had on Medium and other sources. Um, not everything is great on Medium, <laughs> uh, design sort of communities and such, but some of it is excellent. And the great thing about it is more people are writing than ever before. It used to just be a, you know, a small, relatively small subset of academic types that were writing, and they were generally not writing anything all that interesting. But I think with DMI, um, I hate, I'm not really pitching DMI exactly, but I kind of am. But I paid that fee to like join, and it was not cheap, but it put me in a community face to face with people that was just super inspiring and very, very helpful to me in my career. And uh, people from all around the world, you know, and uh, I think there's a filtering process. The stuff that hangs around tends to be worthwhile and the stuff that's too trendy tends to sort of like pass with the seasons, you know. Um, so that's, it's that long standing stuff that, the, the you know that the hangs around that's st the stuff to pay attention to these are some great comments and questions guys uh, yeah hey um michael if i may to um please to jo jo Jan Six, I, I would just add yeah, to true. that as well you know um i mean these days I'm, I'm with the design studio for ernst and young in new york we work yeah. with a lot of huge companies and what i find is like everything we do it's still a people business you know we can have yeah. The technology and whether it's sketch or figma or the old Axure that nobody uses anymore but you know at the end of the day <laughs> when we approach like user research or um yeah. running workshops it's like stages of negotiations and like you don't win them all but you yeah. know you you build that rapport with your clients and there's that yeah. if you if you can capture that essence of being able to get a collaborative group to solve yeah. a problem collectively i feel like yeah. that's a skill that will never lose value, right? Even Absolutely. no matter how much technology they lay into our jobs, there's, it's yeah. still a people business. Absolutely, I'm totally on board with that. Uh, yeah, just recently we did a project uh, and we had been using, I think, Axure for the last couple of projects. And, and we started doing a really ambitious project with uh, our client, uh, Fiserv. And, and I brought in, uh, uh, Tyler Legali, who was a student here at KU back in the day, he never graduated, but I didn't care. He was so fantastic. I've hired him multiple times since to work with me. 
And he did this most amazing work in Figma that was, it's like software comes and goes, right? Applications, but it's the other stuff that hangs around, but it's just so great when you do get a cool new tool that allows you to do shit that you couldn't do before, you know? Yeah, so, totally, totally. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not, I'm not against cool tools at all, but uh, um, all right. Um, let me uh, see here. Go ahead. Oh, do you have access to the chat box right now, Michael? Yeah, I kind of do, yeah. Okay, so great, awesome. I, I also see um, Jacob9 ask questions as, as someone who is a recent graduate right now, in your opinion, would trying to get a job, try, try, trying to a job in UX be better right now or continue schooling? I'm trying to get into the field right now with no luck, which would be more beneficial. Yeah, boy, there's probably a lot of people who have opinions on that question. Uh, I may not be the best one to, to answer, but um, well, I tell you, school, especially if you're borrowing and so forth, it's really hard to look at that cost and stuff. Um, what you could do, it, a lot of our students have done in the past, is you, wherever you happen to be living or working, uh, you know, get a job, you know, find some good work, and then take a class or two, you know, night school, stuff like that. So you can kind of do both. It's not easy, but it's doable, you know. Um, so, uh, so I, I think you can kind of split that one, you know, and try to find, you know, good work and to try to, first of all, to develop a, a really strong portfolio with showing some case histories, you know, some, uh, you know, some uh, business cases, you know, some of the, there's all kinds of great ideas out there for some terrific it's not just looking at images. It's like telling stories about projects and clients and what was the outcome, what were the challenges. And that context is really powerful. And you, you can build it into a really meaningful portfolio that also shows off your writing. You know, yeah, as a designer, you can learn to write, man. And that's pretty powerful because if you can't write a fucking proposal, good luck. You know, you need to really tell that story. So, you know, I don't want to overwhelm you or inundate you with, you know, like lots of big requirements and stuff, but I would try to, you know, just make your way, uh, making some compromises, but also you don't have to go to school to learn. You can learn a lot of stuff on your own. This is not a licensed profession you can acquire a lot of great knowledge in, by all, all sorts of means, you know? And uh, it's nice to do a graduate degree because it is kind of concentrated. Uh, and we do a lot of application stuff recently with Google and coming up with Microsoft. Um, so that can be parlayed into portfolio work as well. But, uh, so you just play that by ear, and I wish you the best. Um, if I see. could chime in real quick. Um, Please. This is Lindsay, because I commented on that in the chat thread. Um, something that I've used as basically a budget hack at companies that I've worked for, whether they've been based in the US or somewhere in the EU or Australia, has been when my executives have been very adamant of, hey, you've only got X amount of money we're going to give you, and that includes your headcount. Um, if there's a project or something else coming up and there just happens to be someone with an awesome portfolio and there's something in that portfolio that I can use to illustrate how they yeah. would bring value to us. Yeah. So what I explained in um, the uh, um, chat thread or was trying to is that if there's something against an, ind an industry or against a company <laughs> that you feel like mm -hmm. there's a gap that there that you can, your skill set, yeah. your knowledge base can then fill, then yeah those leads in those roles can use that to help advocate for your hiring, for your onboarding. So that way it That's becomes really great. a whole cycle. Yeah. Yeah. And if you can get past the HR person, that's like keeping you away from the hiring yeah. manager, maybe. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> uh, but um, I agree. I think, and frankly, that's really like savvy. And, and I've, 
I've worked on the corporate side, but I've also run consulting, you know, group as well. And, you know, if you identify clients or customers or jobs that you would really like to have, figure out where they're weak, find their gaps and maybe things that they were, if you do some analysis, you can figure out what they're trying to do and position yourself right in that gap and show them what you can do and make a compelling uh, presentation and in your portfolio or, you know, or in video, whatever. There's so many ways to like penetrate that, you know, that, that shell around organizations. And I think you have to be imaginative how you do that, you know, without like showing up and, you know, at their doorstep in the middle of the night or something like that. But um, very good. Um, let me see, there were some other things here too. Um, it says jobs are few and far between right now, but there are some out there. If you take your time, there's a company or industry you know will want you to work in, find some way, some things about them you can improve. That's great, that's excellent. Yeah, that was my Thank comment. Thank you so yeah. much, that was great. Uh, great. I just um, want to add on to um, Michael and Lindsay's comments that like if um, Jacob you're not alone there are so many people like you um, who's in mm -hmm. the very similar situations and yeah. whenever I got these questions I think there are uh, very great pros and cons in either option whether you are looking for a job or or should I just continue to looking for a job or should I pursue a graduate degree well, um, the graduate degree has uh, the biggest cons of getting a graduate degree is the financial commitment, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a time commitment too, but then there are, well, first of all, I would like to advise that I would not wait on, like I will actually try to pursue both at the same time. <laughs> not wait one thing, but not doing one thing and wait for the others until the under, other things show some result. I'll try to apply for graduate studies and apply for a job at the same time. You will never lose, you know, in that way. Yeah. Another thing is um, the graduate study can really open up a wide range of design opportunity that you never even thought about what design can do before, you know, you get into the program. Like for example, Michael is doing a lot of collaboration projects uh, with a top name company in international companies. And all this, com all this opportunity is, uh, is for students too, that they got exposed to those great design opportunity while they're in school and be able to put that on their portfolio or, or their resume. Uh, last semester, my students were actually designing a curriculum for medical students. So basically, we were designing a course, like an education for medical students. Oh, sorry, the design students are designing a course, like education courses for medical students, so they can better serve their patients. I mean, what, who would think that that can be something that designer can do, you know, traditionally? So the graduate study is really um, opening up a lot of like opportunity that we never even thought that design can do this, if I can say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's very different from what design school may have been in the past, I think. Um, thank you. Uh, I think- hey, Michael, uh, we, have, yes. um, we have about time left for one more question. Okay, um, great. Before we wrap up. So if anybody has a- burning question they haven't yet asked. Um, I'm interested in knowing yes. how we're seeing diversity, equity, and inclusion play a role in the design industry now. Okay. You're interested in seeing how it's, how it's going now in the design industry? Yeah, uh, like, are we seeing yeah. different trends here? Are there jobs specifically for this realm? Like, <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure I'm the best uh, voice for this. Um, I, uh, hmm. I know that our students are always getting jobs, or for the most part, our people are fairly employable. Um, in terms of 
uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, I don't know. Anybody have some thoughts about that? I have a quick thought on that. This is Anita Hart. Um, I am in software design, so I I think that the trend in um, in diversity and inclusion more in my role is is uh, accessibility. I think that um, they're looking to the designers more and more to um, to understand um, disabilities and understand how to how to make the sites you know available to a wider audience and so i think that i think that as as a designer my role is kind of expanding on my team because of this um, and it's a good thing um, and it's also kind of being able to spread that to the rest of the organization from you know, they're looking at design because we are the empath empathetic you know we're the ones um, that are that are actually um, making products for these people to use so that that's how I see it personally in my role is is uh, it's definitely kind of broadening my responsibilities mm -hmm. that's great thank you uh, before we close tonight I do want to mention to Greg Campbell Greg are you still around um, I'd, I'd like to hear uh, maybe we could get in touch with one another because I don't know a great deal about this uh, responsive, responsible design thinking. I'd be interested to know more about uh, your take on that, and what you have to offer there. And um, also for Christina or Rudolph, I don't know if you're still here, but but there's a ton of good content out there. If you were to, you know, go online and sign up for different design type uh, communities on Medium and other places. I think there's just a ton of really good content out there. Not all of it's great, but you can, f you can almost inevitably find really salient information on almost any topic out there relating to interaction design, user experience design, product, service design. It's really, I think it's kind of a, and this is saying something for an old dude, but it's better than I've ever seen it. There's just a ton of good content out there, you know? And, and I used to publish stuff and that was probably shitty stuff, you know? But now it's, I think it, it's, it's a much higher bar, so hey, um, very Mike, good. Michael, are you guys uh, full remote at KU now with the program? Like if, you know, cause I, I mentor a lot of designers in New York and, if somebody you know from out of state is looking to take a course non degree seeking, yeah. or are you guys doing right. a full remote? We are, Joe. Um, oh, wow. Okay. And we have been doing it now, uh, well, off and on for probably three to four years. You know, in various courses. For instance, our human factors course is taught by Stephen Hassard, PhD, oh, with yeah. Google yeah. in Good LA and such. Yeah. Yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah. Garmin, right? Yeah, we, and, we went back to Garmin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So yeah. in any case, so, uh, and also I think because KU is now struggling to figure out how to, how to populate these courses, uh, we've been getting queries for years from people all around the world to do online. And I'm cool with online. I, you know, I don't have any problem. We've kind of done it partially online for a quite a while but but I think KU's the graduate school is finally going to break down and just open up full online for uh, for KU design and um, not have to use uh, you know some lame sort of software platform that they contracted for we can do it ourselves we don't need them so it looks like things are gonna break uh, you know, some good things come out of terrible circumstances. You know? Yeah, we've all been so. accelerated to the uh, new yeah. remote world. I, and I'll say too about the program. I mean, it was, I, I still tell people, and then probably the single best thing I did for my career was um, the graduate program at KU. And, you know, Michael, you were part of that. So thank you. And um, I just, I, I loved it. I think it's a great program and uh, all the best. Well, thanks, Joe. The, my check is in the mail. <laughs> I'm waiting. I'm waiting. <laughs> yes, Anita, you can you can get design toolkit stuff from DMI. You just have to dig in and find it. And you could actually cough up some money and just join them or have your employer pay. 
uh, just for a while, and then you can get into their deep library. There's a ton of stuff in there. So, well, uh, Tom, I we've gone a little over, but uh, oh, it's fine. Yeah, no, thank you so much for uh, presenting and uh, fielding all of these questions. Um, I think there's been some really good chat um, and some some good interactivity on it. So we'll we'll very much look forward to uh, the one in September. Cool. Um, and we'll let everybody know when that's going to be. Um, we'll put it up on the website, um, uxpakc.org. Um, okay. So we uh, we have made a recording of today, um, and I think Lars put up a link in the chat to the presentation itself that Michael shared yeah. here. So yep. great, you can actually download that. It's probably up towards the top of the chat if you scroll up. Uh, okay. He did it around 7:29 p.m. So great, uh, and we'll email out the recording probably tomorrow or um, the following day. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just keep keep ahead of what we're doing on social media, on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, Monday, like I said, we've got another presentation with um, Daniel, Professor Daniel Rosenberg on the magic of semantic interaction design at 12 p.m. That's going to be a lot of fun. Actually, there's only about two or three tickets left, which is exciting. Uh, we can speak to that as well. Um, I went to his previous, yeah. uh, a previous webinar by him, and it was a really interesting um, presentation. And he's doing work about how to turn, um, you know, sentences and um, like paragraph structures of user stories into interaction design patterns. So it's very interesting work. It's worth worth going to. Cool. Great. Well, thanks, guys. And Greg, uh, let's Greg Campbell. Let's get in touch with each other, okay? Yeah, I think my good. email's up on the board. Uh, let's chat, okay? Hey, okay. great to see you guys. Uh, you're yeah. my favorites. You guys take care of yourselves. Thank you, Michael. Great to have you. Bye bye now. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Bye, bye everyone. <laughs>